Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to worship on this Lord today, and especially I want to say uh, thank you to all our fathers, grandfathers, and I heard we have at least one great grandfather, I'm sure there are more here today, but as we observe National Father's Day, thank you guys for uh, caring for your family and bringing up your children uh, to know Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Got a few announcements for you this morning. First of all, youth group today from 4 to 6 in the gymnasium. Also, portals of prayer for July and September are in the narthex and also the church office if you'd like to pick one of those up. Again, a reminder, if you enter the hospital, uh, please uh, give us a call so we can come and pay you a visit. The hospitals do not contact us. Uh, it's been some time since I've actually received a phone call from the hospital saying, you know, so-and-so was here. So uh, please bear that in mind and uh, offer that encouragement to us. And then finally, uh, with the centennial coming around and, and, and so forth and all the celebrations, uh, next week uh, we will not be having a 10 o'clock traditional service. And the reason for that is because there's a 150th anniversary community service, uh, which will be held. The doors will be open. It'll be at the pavilion. Doors will be open at 930 with the service starting at 10 a.m. So we want to uh, support our community in this time of celebration uh, as we give thanks to God for 150 years of blessings for our Pierce community. So again, no 10 o'clock service next week, but we will have 8 o'clock service and we will have Monday night service at 7. So with that, we'll begin our service with the singing of our opening song. Thank you. 
day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Paul writes, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. In our thinking, speaking, and acting, we have not commended ourselves. Worse than our sinful condition, we are bound to continue to sin. We cannot help ourselves, but we have us. Then he writes, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. But then Paul writes, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Open our hearts, Lord, all creation, to recognize the forgiveness you want for us, the protection you afford each day, and the strength you provide, that we may share your love. Our Lord Jesus, whom wind and sea and all creation obey, has taken away the sins of the world. Because of his sacrifice for you within his own creation today is indeed the day of salvation. Today he tells you also, peace, be still. As a call and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your mercy, guide the course of this world so that your church may joyfully serve you in godly peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Ezekiel chapter 17, beginning at the 22nd verse. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird, in the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Our epistle lesson is from 2 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 6. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I have listened to you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our hearts are wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children, widen your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth mm -hmm. chapter. Glory to you, Lord. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, <coughs> just as he was. And the other boats were there with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filled. <coughs> But he was in the stern, asleep on, on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind the sea obey him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated and we invite the children to come home. <coughs> sins on you at all. And 
All of this is what God does to bring you to Jesus. Is Jesus strong? Yeah, Jesus is really, really strong. Is there anything in the world stronger than Jesus? No. No, there's not. Jesus is strong. And God the Father, he is really strong. You see, in Father's Day, we celebrate our dads being strong. But we can also celebrate the fact that God the Father, who is our Heavenly Father, he is really strong too. And because he has sent Jesus to save you, and because Jesus is strong, you are with him. So that even though we are weak, we're with somebody that's so strong. And no matter what happens in our life, we're going to be safe because Jesus is the one who's got us in his arms. And nothing can get past Jesus. So I hope you can, first of all, say happy Father's Day to your dads today, but also thank God and pray to God and know that Jesus is strong and you belong to him. And you are safe because you are God's child. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for making us your children. You have sent Jesus into the world to be strong for us so that he would be strong enough to rise from the dead and bring us into everlasting life. Help us always to be comfortable in knowing that we are loved by you and that your love is so strong Nothing can ever hurt us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, thanks, guys. Go back to your seat. We'll continue the next song.
Um, and to everybody else, I hope you take a little bit of time out of your day to just let the dads in your life know that you are thankful for all the work that they do. And uh, for all you dads out here, I hope that you just simply rejoice in knowing that your work as a father is God's plan for your life. And so no matter how hard it is, I pray that you would always draw strength and encouragement from the cross of Jesus, knowing that God's mercies are new every morning. So every day when you wake up, you've got just a fresh, clean opportunity to go out, conquer the day, and be the best dad you can be, knowing that this really does please God. And this is a good work. Uh, so happy Father's Day. Hope you have a great day planned ahead for yourself. Uh, our text for this morning is our Old Testament reading from Ezekiel, where the Lord says, On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches, produce fruit, and become a noble cedar tree. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. All right, so I'm from New York, and coming to New York, to Nebraska, everybody always asks me, Wow, it must be so different. What's different? And finally, the other day, I realized something that's a little bit different about New York and Nebraska. And I'll start off by saying that some of you know that I like to hunt turkeys. And so I just kind of grew up doing this, but growing up, kind of interested in hunting and animals and turkeys and all that stuff, I got to the point where I just... When I drive down the road, I'd always be looking in the fields on the sides and seeing if there's any animals in the fields, just because it gave me something to do. It was fun. Um, but in New York, it's a lot easier to do that because number one, the fields are way smaller, and so as you're driving down a country road, if you look to the side of the field, uh, your eyes can scan across it pretty quickly. If there's anything in that field, you're going to see it. Uh, unlike Nebraska. Nebraska's fields are huge. You know, you drive down a country road, and I swear every quarter has about 10 million acres in it. It's hard to see anything, especially when you're looking for a bird this big. <laughs> Anyways, um, but, but also it's more difficult because there's random little cedar trees growing in certain fields. And in New York, we don't have cedar trees growing in the middle of fields. So I can't tell you how many times I've been driving around and you know, I'd see something in a field, and normally when I see something that sticks out, my brain tells me, oh look, that's an animal. Let me stop and take a look at it, it's cool. But here, I can't tell you how many times I've stopped, and then what I thought was an animal I got all excited about was a cedar tree. <laughs> and you know, I just, all over the place, there's these little green trees, the kind of you know, full, thick pine trees, and they throw me off every time. Anyway, so that's what I learned from New York to Nebraska, is that Nebraska has cedar trees. <laughs> and uh, despite how deceptive I think they are, um, nevertheless, they did something important to me in that they made me appreciate our Bible text for this morning. You see, because today in our Bible text, Ezekiel offers us a metaphor, or an image, where Jesus is a majestic cedar tree. And so if you go home today and somebody asks what the sermon is about, just say, Jesus is my cedar tree. And then people are going to look at you like you're crazy, and appropriately so, because without any context, that doesn't make any sense. And so what I want to do is try to make some sense out of what Ezekiel is saying. And so if we would look at the context of our Old Testament reading, we would find out that Ezekiel is speaking in a riddle. And... He uses a riddle to say that Jesus is a, a cedar tree. But the riddle itself goes like this. Ezekiel says that there is an eagle who swoops down and plucks off a twig from the top of a cedar tree. This eagle then goes and plants this twig on the top of a high mountain in fertile soil uh, with abundant water. And then this twig grows into a vine. But then there comes another eagle, a second eagle, and the vine sees the second eagle and rebels against its first, the first eagle and planted it and stretches itself toward the second. But when the first eagle comes back, he sees that the vine has rebelled against him, and so he swoops down, grabs the vine by its roots, and pulls it up out of the ground. 
so that it withers and dies. This is the riddle that Ezekiel tells us. And so now the question is, what in the world does that mean? And so if we uh, read the context a little more, right? Our Old Testament reading was only three verses long, so if we, uh, if we read the text around it, we would uh, find that Ezekiel is actually speaking to the house of Judah, uh, that is, the God's people from whom Jesus was promised to come, who will come out of Judah. But Ezekiel is speaking this way to warn them that they're about to be destroyed. It was about the year 600 B.C. or a little bit after, and the house of Judah was led by a man named Zedekiah. And Zedekiah himself was actually under the authority of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was off uh, in the east over in the land of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar was the first eagle. But anyway, Zedekiah, he didn't live under authority very well, and so he rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. But in order to do this, he needed extra help and army assistance. And so he ended up turning down to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, looking for support for armies and such. And so Pharaoh is the second eagle. Uh, the problem is that Pharaoh didn't help Zedekiah at all, didn't give him anything. And so Zedekiah is all by himself with no help, and now he's facing the wrath of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes and he just destroys Zedekiah, and he crushes the house of Judah and Jerusalem. Right, Jerusalem, also known as Zion. And so what we see here is that Ezekiel is speaking a word of judgment in that these mighty high nations were going to come down and uh, destroy God's rebellious people. You know, sometimes I think we get scared uh, about something very similar. I mean, I don't think anybody's worried about King Nebuchadnezzar coming and fighting us, but I do think that sometimes we look at the mighty, strong, high nations and we worry that they might end up hurting God's people. You know, we look around and the governments don't necessarily advocate so strong Christianity. Um, and, you know, we look in history and sometimes I think we get scared that the governments and those in authority might end up hurting the church. Um, and so I think we get afraid sometimes of this. But when that happens, then... We should turn back to God's word, and we should listen to what Ezekiel has to say uh, more of. You see, because Ezekiel's word of judgment is not his last word. That at the end of all this judgment, we actually get uh, our Old Testament reading for this morning. Uh, three verses in which God now makes a gracious promise to his people that he's not going to let these mighty nations come and completely destroy the house of Judah. That God is not going to let those in high authority come and completely destroy Zion and bring it down to nothing. Rather, it's the reverse. You see, God promises that he is going to take these high and mighty nations and he's going to bring them down to nothing. And out of these lowly people from Zion, he's going to raise up a magnificent high cedar tree. And so this is what Ezekiel's talking about in our Old Testament reading, where he says that God himself will come and pluck off a tender young sprig from the top of a cedar tree. Jesus. And then he's going to plant it on the high and lofty mountain of Zion. And then it's going to grow. And it's going to become a noble cedar tree. And in its branches, and under the shade of its branches, every single bird of the air will find a safe dwelling place to nest. 
You see, from this tree, everybody is going to know that Jesus is Lord. That's what the text says. And so in this riddle, we see that Ezekiel is trying to reveal the ways of God to his people. That this is simply how God works. God takes things that are high and mighty, and he brings them down low. And God takes things that are down low, and he raises them up high, like a cedar tree. It starts out as a young shoot down low, and it grows up tall. And so Ezekiel calls our attention to the work of God Almighty himself. See, because God Almighty, who dwells in the heights of heaven, he made himself low. So low that he would be born of a woman and walk on the ground of the earth in the form of a man named Emmanuel. God would make himself so low that he would willingly bear the shame and carry your sins all the way to Mount Zion, where he would die on a cross and be buried. And as this young sprig is buried in the ground, yet Jesus will rise up in the resurrection, and he will ascend to his rightful place above, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, never to die again. And this Jesus, who is raised from the dead into everlasting life, he is this cedar tree, wherein all the birds of the air, birds of every sort, of every wing, will be able to find a safe place to nest. You see, in Jesus, you have a safe place to live and to dwell. This is what God has in store for you. And in Jesus, God will take a sinner like you and me Connect us to Jesus, and we will be up high. So my question for you today is, what sins are you holding on to to try to help yourself climb up that ladder and make yourself high and mighty? What has taken the high place in your life so that you no longer fear, love, and trust in God above all things. What are you so scared of losing that you'll sin to keep it? What do you love so much that you'll sin to get it? Figure that out and then let it go. You see, it's okay to fall away from our sins and be brought down low. Because you don't need to be afraid to be down low before God. You don't need to be afraid to be poor in spirit before God. Because you know the way that God works. God takes things that are low, and he lifts them up high. Just like God ended up taking your lowly, dried-up heart, and he washed you in the waters of your baptism, filling you with water, the waters of baptism, the waters of life. And so when Jesus, when God did this, he forgives your sins, and now he grafts you as a branch onto the tree of Jesus. You see, through faith in Christ, God raises you up through the peace and the joy and the life of the gospel, which today has come to you in the image of a cedar tree that is planted on the height of Zion. You see, this is a great image for Father's Day, I think, because, you know, as fathers, who God has called to be the, the head of the house, as Christ is the head of the church, as a father goes about doing his work of raising his family up in the faith and teaching his house to fear and love 
God. And reading and speaking the word of God in his house. This is God himself working through fathers to expand his family tree as he works through dads to, to graft people onto the tree of Jesus. You see, God works in this way in our own very homes to make children of God, to make branches of this cedar tree, and to nurture his children in the faith of Jesus Christ so that they would grow up knowing the one who died on a tree so that all may come into life everlasting. This is good news. This is good work. Happy Father's Day. Uh, may you always be strengthened by the love of Christ, this day and always. In the name of Jesus. We continue with our next song. Stay seated. <coughs>
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise. We praise you for our creation, preservation, and redemption. We thank you for raising your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead and for preparing a place eternal in heavens for all who trust in your Son as their Savior. For sending us your Holy Spirit so that we might accept Jesus as Lord, we give you thanks. We confess, O oh Lord, that we have often attempted to hide from you. Our sins have often broken the lines of communication between us. We claim to be your children through faith in Christ, but we have often failed to do your will. We have not always behaved as members of your family and have permitted Satan to drive a wedge of division between us. For giving the world the impression that your kingdom is divided against itself, forgive us, O Lord. May your Holy Spirit never leave us or forsake us. When we stray from your fold, graciously search us out and find us. When troubles and afflictions seem greater than we can bear, help us to remember that our mortal bodies are only the temporary dwelling place of your Spirit. Keep in our hearts and minds the assurance that you have built for us a house eternal in the heavens. And when the time of our departure from this earth draws near, take us to live with you eternally. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We remember in our prayers those hospitalized, especially Danny Anderson, who remains hospitalized in Omaha, and also those that are continuing their battle for recovery. For Michelle Ronspies and Barry Tejan, Mike Test and Sharon Brockmeyer, and Larissa Wilson. And we also pray for those with ongoing struggles, for Miriam Krieger and Pam Halsey, Sharon Stanachek and Connie Wyatt, Gretchen Trinkwein, Sue Brodhang and John Weber, Terry Altwine, Sherry Stanachek, Jolene Buss, Dave Meinke, and Brenda Hamilton. Bless all of these, your servants, dear Lord. Grant them strength and healing. Lift their spirits. Give them the assurance of your love and the peace which only you can provide. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our We rejoice with Bill and Cheryl and Buss, who celebrated the 61st first wedding anniversary on June 19th. For the many years of love and blessings you provided them, Lord, we thank and praise you. We rejoice with them and their family at this incredible milestone in their married life. Lord, in your mercy. We also remember missionaries, Reverend Stephen and Maggie Oliver, who served the Lord through the LCMS as missionaries in the Asia region. Bless them as they work among the people in that land and grant, Lord, and through their sharing and witness, many may know your love and peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who protect and watch over us and put their lives on the line to keep us safe. We thank you, Lord, for their work and dedication. Be with and bless them always. The Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And finally, on this National Father's Day, we thank you, Lord, for all of our Christian fathers, for the blessings that are ours through their strong faith and witness, through their love and discipline, and most of all, for their faith and trust in you. Bless and guide them, and may we celebrate today on this National Father's Day the gift that you've given us in our Christian fathers. The Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Again, we pray for our leaders in both state and church, be with the sick, the lonely, and the depressed. We ask these favors, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior. Amen. Please rise as we join our hearts in the prayer our Savior himself taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated.